Hi guys, and I'm back with another interesting story. Um, this one, not so much as a mystery, but um, let's look into it. This is one of the uh, our most Shakespearean tales in our recent history. This is the story of Ornthal James Simpson and Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. We won't forget Ron. Um, I want to look at if OJ really had the propensity to do this crime. You know, if you were around at that time, he was acquitted. However, he did lose in the civil case, which always is perplexing to me. If you lose in the civil case, somebody thought you did it. <laughs> so, um, Anyways, we're going to take a look at that. So before we even get started, let me give you a little bit of history. For those of you that might just be a little too young uh, or you only saw the TV show or any documentaries, and this is just going, going to be just a brief overview. So let me back it up a little bit. And on March 3rd, 1991, there was a man by the name of Rodney King in LA. He was driving under the influence. He was in a chase with the police. They ended up stopping him in a neighborhood, proceed to make him get out of the car, pulled him out of the car. He was actually too intoxicated to really get out of the car on his own. He was a big guy, big guy. And the police proceeded to wail on him. They hit him and beat him with their blackjacks, batons, whatever you call them. And uh, they just beat him down short of his life. At the same time that they were doing that, a guy by the name of George Holliday was filming. He had just gotten a new um, camcorder. You remember back in the day, the big camcorders you can get. And he had it sent filmed on them. He had the whole scene. He had every bit of it. He proceeded to take that video to the news and he gave it to them. And that's how it got public. Now, after Rodney King's beating, um, all the police that were involved got arrested. They went to trial, but they were acquitted. And man, that turned LA upside down. Okay. Literally people were absolutely furious with what happened. And that started the LA riots. If you haven't heard of those, look it up. It's everywhere. I think they even have it up on Netflix, but they literally burned down <clears throat> their own neighborhoods, people's own neighborhoods. They burned down. They didn't go up to Beverly Hills or anything like that. They burned the neighborhood down and everyone was in it. In fact, you know, I'm from Las Vegas. So well, I moved to Las Vegas when I was a teen. So at that point I was uh, 31 and they were even riding in on the west side of Las Vegas. Um, now, these are facts I'm telling you. Some of it might be alleged it's for entertainment only. Let me just put that out there. So with that type of energy in the air, like I said, they had the riots. Um, it even included another man by the name of Reginald Denny. Reginald Denny had nothing to do with anything. He was a guy driving a truck down the street in Los Angeles, where people that were rioting ended up pulling him out because he was in the black neighborhood and he was white and they pulled him out of his the cab portion of the 18 wheeler and they proceeded to beat him. They even took a brick block and threw it on his head and everything else and almost killed him. And that was April 29th, 1992. OK, so the town went crazy. Ultimately, the cops were acquitted. Then in time, the federal agency took it and they were found guilty and they had to go to prison. It was taped. There was no way around it. And it was extreme excessive force. Even if the guy was intoxicated, even if he was speeding, people do that all day, every day. And so it didn't require him to take that type of a beat down, which really affected him. And God rest his soul, he's passed away now. Um, Rodney King that is. But I tell you that because now here we have this crime on in the backdrop of this real 
anger that people had for the people in Los Angeles, the officials, the police and all and all. So on the day of June 12th, 1994, so I wrote my little notes down so I can refer to them as I go along so I don't miss any important dates. On the day of June 12th, 1994, um, about 4.30 p.m., uh, O.J. Simpson and Nicole's daughter, Sydney, was going to her middle school recital. Now, at this point, um, O.J. and Nicole had many getting togethers and breaking up together, break, breaking up till finally they separated. So when he showed up, he was late to the recital. Partly he was late because he was allegedly having Cato, if you remember Cato, Kalen, calling different women and setting up dates for him. And he was doing all of that. Okay. But he, he says he wanted to really get back with Nicole, but he was still doing everything that was a cause for their problems in their relationship. So they went to the recital and that was fine. But then after the recital, the family, um, Nicole's family, had decided to go to an Italian restaurant that is no longer there um, called Mezza Luna. Um, I think that's in Dana Point. Um, anyways, could be in L.A. But they were going to go there for a family dinner in honor of Sydney's special day. <clears throat> Excuse me. So at that point, O.J., asks can he go too Nicole tells him to get away from me leave me alone I'm not dealing with you it's over leave me be so at that point OJ was furious okay this was his wife and in his mind that was his property it didn't matter how many mistresses his, he had or whatever he was doing it didn't matter this was his wife these were his kids and you're going to do what I tell you to do he <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. He was came back complaining. He was really angry uh, about her rejecting him going, that he couldn't have the dinner with the family, as well as he was talking about she had a dress on that was too tight and he just did not appreciate it. That evening, um, Nicole's mother, Juditha, I think that's how you pronounce her name, uh, called Mezzaluna because she left her glasses at the ta on the table at the restaurant. She ended up talking to a hostess and to Ron Goldman. And Ron assured her that he would, um, when he gets off work, he would drop the glasses over at Nicole's house. Now, some people have tried to speculate that they had a whole thing and a whole relationship or whatever. At the end of the day, um, she and her husband were divorced. So if that was true, that was her business. Um, the family has never spoken of anything like that. So you know, out of respect for the family. I'm not going to even insinuate that. But anyways, now here we are. Um, it's 10.15 p.m. Nicole's neighbor, she's in a condo. Her neighbor hears a dog barking at, a, you know, 10.15. It's a real quiet area. Um, I've actually gone up there and looked at the that her uh, neighborhood as far and, and, and OJ's too on Rockingham. Anyways, it's super beautiful. It's super quiet. Um, so the neighbors are hearing this dog just barking like crazy. And they, don't, they do not know why. And this was at 1015. Um, and the police say that this was when the start of the timeline murder happened. So now the, a neighbor is out and he's taking his dog for a walk. And all of a sudden he sees this stray Akita, which is Nicole's dog. Um just walking around like almost as if it's lost no leash no nothing um he takes the dog home and then another neighbor proceeds to take over the dog but let's skip over to at 10 22 a limo arrives at oj's home this limo comes because the limo driver is supposed to take oj to the airport he was going to an event in chicago the following day he got there at 1022. He rang the bell because um, he was a little bit early. He didn't get too stressed about that, but he knew that nobody answered. And he didn't see anyone. There was no one out there. Um, now at 1040, another neighbor says that they actually heard a man yelling, hey, hey, hey. And nobody had any idea what was going on. 
at 1045, Cato Caitlin, who was like the real character in this particular play, he hears thumps and bumps alongside of his house. Cato was a friend of Nicole's and Cato was um, living on OJ's property because OJ didn't want him to live there with Nicole. He was so jealous and so possessive. So Cato lived in a guest house out by the pool and he heard this thumping and bumping and he thought it was a storm or he didn't know what, but um, he didn't he didn't look out to see because it kind of freaked him out. Now it's now 11.02 and um, OJ finally comes out of where the house to um, get into the limo. Now the limo driver says that he saw a tall guy, uh, looked like a dark complected guy going into the house prior to OJ actually coming out of it. Um, but he didn't think much about it because uh, he saw this dark figure guy and he saw Cato, Kaylin as well. So like I said, 11.02, OJ finally comes out of the house and gets into the limo. Now it's 11.40 and another neighbor, a friend to the first neighbor who found the Akita, decides that let's take the Akita, her and her husband, and let's take it on a walk. Maybe someone is out here looking for their lost dog. They, as, as they get the dog ready for a walk, they notice the dog's paws are full of blood. Now they're not walking the dog, the dog is walking them. The dog walks them right to Nicole's condo where these people, these other neighbors, they see the bodies on the ground. Nicole sustained incredible amount of slashes. Her neck was cut so deep it went all the way back to the back of her neck, the, her, her spine. She received numerous stabs all over her body and in her head. Um, Ron showed up obviously with the glasses because when the police arrived they saw the glasses on the ground um, but he also was just stabbed. He had a tremendous amount of defense wounds. He was fighting the guy off so in my opinion is the hey 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 was him hollering hey 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 when he saw what OJ was doing to Nicole. But he, stabbed, he received stab wounds in his neck, his juggler, um, his scalp, his face, uh, and many more parts of the body. So the police came once the people with the dog saw, and they saw who it was. They went in the house, they found two children. They had two young children, uh, Sydney and Justin were their names, they were asleep. Um, they got the kids out of the house. They saw that this was OJ's wife's house. They saw his picture. They knew OJ. OJ and Nicole had had a history of domestic abuse. He would beat her up regularly. There's even a tape out there, 911 call, where you can hear OJ hollering at her while she's talking to the police and saying, you can hear him hollering. That's him hollering in the background and trying to get into the house. OJ was never arrested. OJ, if you don't understand, was a huge star. He was a major football player. He made commercials. You probably remember the Hertz commercial where he's running through the airport with a briefcase and jumping over things. He made movies. He was huge, very handsome, very handsome. People really liked him, okay? Um, yeah, he was arrogant. Yeah, he he was a big guy. In fact, he left his first wife for Nicole. He actually met Nicole when she was 18, when she was a waitress in a restaurant that he frequented. And then they began to talk and they got together that way. Um, so at the in in the once the bodies were discovered and the police found who it was, they got in touch with OJ. Um, OJ wasn't particularly surprised and that's what was surprising them this is this is your ex-wife this is the mother of your children why aren't you you know extremely surprised why aren't you jumping on the plane right away well come to find out that OJ in the midst of this murder had cut his finger so badly he was bleeding all in the hospital and and 
In fact, um, it is said from the trial that he even had a pair of bloody socks that were in his bedroom that had the blood of Nicole and Ron intermingled. There was blood on the side of the, his Bronco. There was blood uh, in the center council, blood smears that was, that was their blood as well. So once um, OJ comes back, they question him, okay? And they are deciding, are we going to charge him from this? Because they didn't see any signs of a break-in. There was no, nothing missing, nothing stolen, nothing broken. There weren't any illicit drugs around. She didn't have a, a record of anything. Uh, her only records were with her conflicts with him, which there were a number of them. Like I said, he didn't get arrested. He was big. He was famous. By the time people, police would come to his house, they were so in awe that it was him. And he had this knack of really talking you out of whatever you thought. He was quick. Okay. So he could talk you down and make it seem like she's complaining or she really hit me or I was defending myself. Anything that abusers usually do. So then on, uh, let me take a look. The next day, I think it was on the 17th of June, um, OJ is supposed to turn himself in. They wait and they wait. He doesn't show up. The next thing that we see, and trust me, I watched every bit of this. <laughs> the next thing, the police are on TV and they're saying that OJ has not turned himself in. They've reached out to his attorney and other people who knew him, and he is nowhere to be found. Okay. Uh, a few hours later, we have Robert Kardashian. Yes, that Kardashian, Kim Kardashian's father, who proceeds to read a suicide note that OJ has written, saying that he didn't do this and that he loved his family and he loved everybody. Okay. Now, OJ, rather than turning himself in, he is in his Bronco with Al Collins driving, heading towards the border, heading down towards from Beverly Hills down towards like San Diego, uh, quite a drive if you know that part of the world. Uh, he was on the way down there. They were able to, the police were able to tap into him through the phone in the car to talk him out of anything foolish. Al Collins said that he had a gun to his head and he wanted to kill himself. So my question is, if he didn't do it, why would he want to call kill himself? Now you can say he was over emotional. He was so in love with her that he just couldn't go on living, except for a couple things. Um, Sydney and Justin, those were his children with Nicole, who was going to raise them if he didn't. The other thing, inside the truck, they found a passport, um, a must, excuse me, a mustache and spirit gum to glue it on. So that was his disguise. He wasn't going to kill himself. He was going to get away. The police eventually talk him out of running away or killing himself or whatever he was going to do. And they end up get, taking him, having him drive home while the helicopters circled. I think they said there was like somewhere between seven or nine helicopters that were flying over the top of his Bronco. I just know that they interrupted the um, the NBA playoffs. And I happen to know because my ex-husband loved basketball. And so it came on right in the middle and we were glued to the TV like everybody else. And at that time, we were in California for a while. So we were there when all the hoopla and the people were out and they were really people driving out we were out looking over the overpass on the freeway with signs go juice go go oj go um nobody could believe he could have done this because it was um he was he seemed so amiable okay he was in on our tv you you saw those hertz commercials all the time he even was chevrolet he had a chevrolet commercial he was just a very popular figure okay um, he ended up getting arrested that night once he got back to his home out of the Bronco. Now <laughs> come some of the key players. OJ had a slew of attorneys, okay? Um, OJ had Robert Shapiro, 
Johnny Cochran, um, F. Lee Bailey. It, that always threw me. F. Lee Bailey, Barry Sheck, um, Robert Kardashian, and the one and only Alan Dershowitz. <laughs> if it's something, if it's something that is not right or dirty or something, you're gonna find Alan Dershowitz. I'm just saying. They had all these attorneys going up against Marsha Clark and Christopher Darden um, in the backdrop of people, uh, black people especially, not trusting the police. And they were the people that were in the jury. Um, they wanted to get the, the case moved, but they would not move the case. Um, I think it was Judge Ito. He was a character, but they wouldn't move the case. So they had to have the case right there. Um, and if you watch the case, and which I did like religiously, religiously at that time, I was uh, going to have my third daughter and I was off on maternity leave off and on here and there. So I was able to, to be there and, um, and see what was happening. Ultimately, OJ was acquitted. And then they asked the women, especially the black women on the jury, and they said it, that they couldn't trust the police. The way they did Rodney King is now we're going to do to you and you are not going to be able to put him in jail. And I'm here to tell you that I was devastated. And I'm going to tell you why. The day that um, it came up that he had committed the crime, I had a dream. Now, just recently, I told this to one person. I'm going to tell it to you guys. I had a dream. And in the dream... I went to this party and it was all dark, you know, like a party atmosphere. And there was a long table of food and everybody at the party was dressed in like white, long gowns and things like that, except for OJ. He was at the party and he was sitting in a chair, like a folding chair in the middle of the room with a dark suit on with a spotlight glowing right down on him. OK, so now I walk into this room. I'll never forget. I walked into the room. I walked behind him. And I walked over to the table where the food was, and I wanted to see who was there. Nicole was there, and Ron was at this particular party. So I went up to Nicole, and I said, did OJ do this? And she said, yes, he did. Go ask him. I never spoke to Ron. So I, in the dream, this is a dream, I walked up to OJ. He had his head down like this with his hands, and he was crying. And I said, OJ, did you kill Nicole? And he shook his head, yes. And the tears were flowing. And then I woke up. From that point on, there was nothing you could tell me that said that he didn't do it. And if you really got a chance to listen to the trial and look at the evidence, he did it. Point blank and simple. But um, karma is, is, a, is a you know what. So... Ultimately, in 2008, it was uh, October 1st, 2008, OJ and some of his uh, cohorts went to Las Vegas because once he had all this trouble, he had to start selling everything, okay, because he ended up losing a civil case. And so he had to sell a lot of things because he had to pay the Goldmans for the wrongful death of their son. <clears throat> so... A friend of his told him, hey, there's this guy, he got in touch with me, and he's going to meet us at the Palace Station in Las Vegas. And if you're a real Las Vegas person, like you go there all the time, you know where the Palace Station is on West Sahara. Um, it's up in the neighborhood. <laughs> Said that he was going to be at the Palace Station and come to the room. And his friend said, okay, well, I'll come. He said he was going to come by himself. And I'll look at the stuff and I'll probably buy it because the guy that had the memorabilia was trying to sell it. Well, uh, OJ and his friends are on camera because there's cameras everywhere in the casino walking up as a group to the guy's room. They go in the room. The OJ is yelling about he wants his stuff back and he pulls out a gun, points it at the guy gets his stuff back okay nobody gets shot nobody gets hurt but the guy ended up getting in touch with the police and OJ was on his way going back to California and I was watching the news in Las Vegas and they literally stopped him and 
going to the airport. I think it was even at the airport. They stopped him and arrested him. And there was a female judge there, and she really reamed him out. And her thing was basically, you got away with that first murder, but you're not going to get away with this. He ended up getting 33 years. His first ability to be paroled was after nine years, and that's what happened. He was, he spent nine years in prison, and then he was paroled. So karma is something else. He's still out there walking around in Vegas doing the most. So now I want to take a look at some of their numbers and what's in their stars. It's kind of revealing. I'll be right back. Okay, and I'm back. So the first thing I want to do is to look at um, each player and I want to look at their birth dates and I definitely want to look at their numbers. But the first number I want to look at is June 12th, 1994. And that is the day of the murders, June 12th, 1994. When we add that whole set of numbers up, the, the month, the day, the year, it was a number five, five day. Okay, that was a number five. And that would have been a very severe day. Number five, and remember this because you're going to hear that number five again. Number five is a very harsh number. It can be a real time of testing and severity. You have to learn the hard way. But if you learn, that's great. You you get better, brighter, everything else. The, inner, the, the planet's energy that is on that number five is Mars. And Mars is hot and fiery and will burn you up. It is a very difficult day. So now you look at June 12, 1994, and this is for the parties involved. It was going to be a rough day, and they had no idea what was coming to them. Had I known them or been around, I would have told them all to stay home, stay in your house, lock the door, don't do anything. But life is not like that. Um, the first person I want to look at is Nicole. Nicole's birthday was May 19th, 1959. And looking at her birthday, uh, her number five, so she had a lot of um, a lot of freedom growing up. She had a lot of freedom. She had to she had to grow up kind of fast. That's why she was out of the house at her age um, and working full time, 18 and not college. Um, she was pretty and um my mother used to always say, pretty girls pay a price. And that was her life full of um, like hardships and getting messed around with guys that were never any good. Okay, and let me just say that. Guys that were older than her, guys that were promising her the world if she did this thing or that thing that may be less than dignified. This is all alleged, by the way. That may be less than dignified than what she should, should have. A lot of hardships and tests. And at this time, this is when she went and met OJ. So that tells me right away they had drama from the start. Okay. It was always a harsh situation. Her number 19, which is the day that she was born on, tells me a couple of things. The one and the nine together is a one. So that tells me that she really was a person that was much more independent than what she seemed. She was uh, independent. Uh, she was uh, selfish. She could be selfish. She liked to be first. She liked to be the best. She liked to be the prettiest, the richest, the all of that. She loved fine living as a tourist. Um, she liked luxury. She liked nice things. But then she's got a one and a nine that number one says that even though she was married, she would almost have to live like she was single with her number nine spouse because that is such a unique number. It should be a humanitarian. It should be a philanthropist. Um, it should be someone who's empathetic and sympathetic and high spirited. But if it's ill dignified, as in this particular case that this person was, even though he didn't show that to the public, she knew who he was. If it's ill dignified, this person is a complainer. This person is extremely moody. Um, this person is harsh. Doesn't have a good word to say about too many people. Is very judgmental. Um, her life path is a number three. Number three that she tells you about her femininity. That's why if you see pictures of her, she was quite beautiful, very girly girl type of person. She liked to have a good time. She liked to be like the life of the party, 
tell the jokes, laugh out loud, toss her hair. He didn't like that of her. So if she doesn't have the ability to live that part of her number, then it's ill-dignified. And then it is the similar to him, that complaining, that fussing, that harping, that nagging, that criticizing, that I'm a victim, I'm a victim. In this case, she was a victim. And um, I always say words have power. So if you're if you're saying that, then then it is that. Um, for that particular year, for her, um, and it was a number five year for her. Uh, it was a number five year period, but with her five and a nineteen, it was a number eleven year for her. It was a number eleven year. And remember, I always tell you, number eleven years is a master number. And it's a year of tearing things down. So that means that she tore down her marriage. She had problems uh, to some degree with her parents. Her friendships were breaking up and tearing away. Her life was torn away from her. It's very harsh. So you look at a number 11 personal year in a number 5 severe year. There was nothing good that was going to come out for her. And it was destined. It was destined for her. Um, all of this was, mm. um, her rising is in Pisces and when you're rising in Pisces, you can be, um, sacrificial, you can be dreamy, um, you can even be dependent and needy. You also could be into the darker side of things because Pisces has that ability when it's ill dignified to be in dark magic or be in alcohol, be in drugs. So I will I would venture to say to you that she wasn't a drug addict, but did she mess around with drugs, alcohol? Absolutely. Yes, she did. Um, was she addicted? I don't know. It could have been. She's got a son in Taurus, and that is a, a, a sign that has desires. They're always desiring and lusting, and they want more good food, more fine living, more nice things, more money. Hmm. But at the same time, she could be patient and even tempered and even slow to anger. And she would have had to be with this person. This is a, she married this very famous athlete that was a superstar on the ball field and even bigger outside of that. And she had to take the back seat. Um, but she didn't seem like she should have had to have. But with him, you'll see, she had no choice. She had a moon in Libra, once again, that speaks to that very feminineness, that speaks to that not being able to make the best quick decisions, okay? Um, her Mercury is in Taurus. She should have been left here. That, that Taurus can be a very fixed planet, even when things are not good, like we often all say, okay, if it was me, I wouldn't stay with them. I would have left. Okay, that's you. But when you are a person that's really fixed into something, this is how you do. This is where you're going to be. This is what you're supposed to do. It could have been even what she saw because um, there's a lot of crazy that's going on wrong with her. Her Venus is in Cancer. Her Mars is in Cancer. And that tells me she was the killer. <laughs> I mean, not that she killed herself, but... Um, was she aggressive with him? Yes. Yes. They fought battles. They fought battles. His, let me take a quick look at him. His cancer, his Mars is in Gemini. So yeah, they could. He would jump off and say anything harsh, anything, do anything, not talk, over talk, not want to hear what you have to say. Um, talk his way out of any and everything, and she would call him on it. And so it would be a big explosion, whether it was money issues or cheating issues or not spending enough time with her or the children. She would put hands on him, believe it or not. It was so volatile. Um, her Jupiter is in Scorpio. So that Jupiter in Scorpio, that tells me that she was um, intense, but she was big intense. She could really either love you and be good friends with you and very close and tight with you, or she would absolutely hate you. She could flip and then she would hold on to it. That number three says that she would hold on and linger in her madness. They never had a chance to get over it because with him, 
It was one thing after another, after another, after another. There's a lot of water here. Her rising is in Pisces. Her Venus is in Cancer. Her Mars is in Cancer. Her Jupiter is in Scorpio. She was a cesspool, and I'm going to say it like that, um, of emotions, but not good emotions. She was self-medicating. She had depression. Um, she wasn't as happy as she should be with like the way her body looked or the way her face looked. She just wasn't. She felt like if she could do something more, maybe he would stop that. When I look at OJ, I see him. Uh, he is that crazy cancer. I always say that. I'm sorry, cancers. Uh, cancer male is crazy. His birthday was July 9th, 1947 and 8.08 a.m. in San Francisco, California. By the way, um, Nicole was born in Frankfurt, Germany at 2 a.m. Um, O.J. was a number six uh, life path. So, yeah, he carried the burden for everybody. He helped take care of his children, his ex-wife, his mom. Um, some of this I know, some of this I can tell because he was making that kind of money he would also lavish other females, and that would send Nicole crazy. He would buy other females gifts or take them to dinner or buy them dresses and things like that. He was always giving and doing and giving and doing. You imagine giving, doing, giving, doing, giving, doing. His, uh, at the time that he, this situation happened, he was in a, a number 11 personal year. Very hard personal year. A very much a year of tearing stuff down. So if we look at his numbers, he was tired of giving and doing. I'm giving, I'm doing, I'm paying child support. I'm coming to the kids' events. You know, I'm doing paying your house note, whatever. And I can't come to the dinner with my family. Boom, that number 11 kicked in for him. It kicked in and he got irrational. You see, his rising is Leo. And so he was not a, he was, he was, he, he was real, uh, like that mask in, in, in the drama and theater, the one, the happy face and the sad face. He was that. And his rising in Leo would make him very attractive to people, uh, a magnet to people. He loved people. He loved, um, he really did. He loved people. He loved socializing. He loved having cocktails. He loved women. He was a lion. He would roar. But at the same time, he could be domineering and demanding, and that's how he was to her. But he couldn't he couldn't conquer her, okay? He couldn't. Um, his son, like I said, is in cancer, which would make him a good dad. Very warm and affection, affectionate, but yet uh, moody, okay? With her, he would be moody. He would close himself off. He didn't want to talk about this or that. He didn't express his feelings, like this upset me or I feel this. He would express his anger, okay, not his emotions. We are more than just anger. We are all emotions, and all of them are good, used in the right way. His moon is in Pisces. He was not so crazy. So he was really, really, he also, I'm telling you, and this is just alleged, he was on some cocaine or some um, some alcohol for sure. He was. He was on the dark side of things. He was very ill-dignified. He, he was, he would have planned and plot. You see with that Pisces, that moon and uh, that Pisces in that moon sits right there and tells me that he could plan and do things behind your back. He could smile in your face like everything is okay. That's fine. I don't have to go to the restaurant and all the way home plotting on. That's it for you. I'm done with it. I do everything for you. I take care of you. I take care of these kids. I'm constantly giving you money. Da 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 da. Now this is what I'm going to do. His Mercury is in Cancer, so his thoughts would always be through his feelings. How do I feel? How does this feel? And so that night he felt hurt and angry, and with his Mars and Gemini, he jumped and act impulsively. Geminis have a tendency to be impulsive and we think about it later. You think about that knight of swords who's running off with that sword out without even thinking. He didn't think it through. Okay. He didn't think it through. He acted. 
that is it. He acted without thinking it through. He's got a Jupiter in Scorpio. And I think the same thing that she has. Yes. So he was big mad. Okay. He was big mad, big anger, very intense and acting on that. That Mars and Gemini would have had him much, very much like a warrior and argumentative, um, even overly aggressive. Yes. Yes. Why did he do that? He was completely jealous. He was completely uh with no control. He could not control her. For her to have the nerve in his mind to say, no, I can't go to the dinner with you guys. Oh, that was devastating to him in all kinds of ways, in his emotions, in his Mars and Gemini. That just kept repeating, you know, just kept repeating in his mind because Gemini is about your thoughts over and over and over what you said, what you did. Um, his, his, uh, First number seven tells me that um, he must have been real religious. I think he probably was raised up in a very religious home with a lot of prayer, a lot of church. I don't know if he was Jehovah Witness or Baptist or what, but it was very much pray for this and pray for that. And he went with that for a while. But his number nine tells me that he, my friend, is infamous. He is someone that you will never forget because in that placement where that number nine is the age he would have been when he committed that crime. Um, uh, yeah, so he also just, uh, FYI, um, his conflicts are public. Okay. And he had freedom. He could have chosen to stop. Don't let that Gemini side and that Pisces sides run amok and let me stop. It was the combination of the Pisces, the Scorpio and the Gemini that drove him crazy. And then some Leo because Leo is so arrogant. How dare you talk to me? I'm the king da, da, that drove him to it. And he got inside his head. He let his emotions and his thoughts run amok. And he committed that crime, period. Now, people have said he didn't do it. People try to say his son in it. Please do not put that in my comments. His son did not have anything to do with it. His son has, has made his own share of mistakes. But murdering somebody is not one of them. This was OJ right here. And this is for entertainment only, by the way. But OJ had freedom. He has freedom in his life. That is why he rose to the success he did. He chose to work his body and become an athlete and, and be, uh, you know, disciplined and all of that. But his conflicts are public. Here's the here's the cute thing, if you want to say. Nicole was fate. Her situation was all faded and her conflicts were private. And she got killed at night. It was private. It was a private situation. Um. And real quick, let me look at Ron Goldman before I let you guys go. Okay, Ron Goldman. Here we have another cancer. And this is, once again, I'm saying a legend. His birth, well, it's not a legend. He's a cancer. He is. But his birthday was July 2nd, 1968. Um, Ron was in a family when he was growing up that education was key. He had to go to school. He had to study something. And he was very smart at whatever he was going to be majoring in. And I think that he was working at the restaurant trying to get on his feet to do his career. But school, religion, that was really super important to him. Um, his number two in the middle is like when he, in fact, he didn't even get to that. He was just a number seven. He was a good person. Um, he was uh, very focused. He was extremely intelligent. Um, he died at 25, so he never got to his middle number. He just did the seven. Um, he would have been there to help and support others, and that's what he did. Um, his his uh, life at that point was a number four, which was about getting organized, and so he would have been trying to get his act together, okay? He was trying to get his act together, getting out of the restaurant and starting his going into his career. But because his birthday was July 2nd and the crime was in the middle of June, he was in the shadow of his number five year. He was in the shadow of a very severe year. So that energy is right there drawing him right into it. His uh, life path was a number six. And so what I'm trying to tell you, when you have a number six life path, you carry the baggage. And he went in and he fought for 
that lady, he fought for Nicole. He carried the baggage for her and he lost his life because of that. But that's how he was. He was someone that would do for people and help people and cared about people. Uh, he was from Chicago, Illinois, by the way, 7 2 1968. It's so odd now that I think about it, and they seem so young to me at the time, even though I was like 30, 31. Um, I didn't know their ages at all, but I didn't know he was just eight years younger than me. Ron had freedom in his chart. He had free. He did not have to go to the house that night. He could have. It just would have been Nicole would have lost her life. She was going to lose her life anyways. And his conflict was public because he was out there helping her. Um, yeah, that number five day, that June 12th, 1994, that Mars energy on there just burned up a lot of people. His rising is in Virgo. So as far as Ryan goes, he was a real, he seemed to be a real, his mask was a very much a perfectionist type of guy, a very analytical, very systematic, very smart, very hardworking, very driven. So I'm sure that he was trying to get into whatever he was going to get in for his life career and doing the restaurant thing on the side for extra money. His son is also cancer. So that again, speaks of his warmth, his love of family, but the same thing, he still would be uh, moody and to himself. And in terms of did they have a relationship? I think they did. They did. Because of him being so much like OJ, it would have just been natural for her to be drawn to him in some ways. Um, his moon is in Libra and her moon is in Libra. Yeah. So if you're asking me, did they have a relationship? Yeah, they were they were talking. They had a relationship. They had a real compatibility um, his Mercury was in Gemini. So that tells you that's the genius sign. He was really bright, very, very intelligent person. His Venus is in cancer. So he would have made a great husband, a great lover, being someone that always remembered the anniversaries and the birth dates. Funny, his Mars is in cancer. That is why he fought. A lesser man would have ran away. Mm -mm. He said, Hey, 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 to break that up and he went to battle and that Mars and Cancer would have propelled him right in there to battle. That number seven, that being a servant of people, that number six, always helping people. He did exactly what he would have been expected to do. He did it. Um, and then his Saturn is an Aries, so that would have made him impulsive. He would have jumped at it and didn't have a chance to think about it. It happened so quickly that he didn't have a chance to think about it. So when we come to, we look at this particular situation. Did OJ did it? Absolutely. And I would have said it another way, but I don't want to say that on <laughs> YouTube. They don't ding me for cursing. OJ absolutely did it. O OJ was controlling. He was domineering. He probably still is controlling, domineering, very demanding. You do it my way or it's the highway. I'm going, you're going to do everything I tell you to do. You're going to be faithful. You're not cheating. I'm cheating. I'm doing what I want to do. Stay out of my business. As long as this house note is paid, that's fine. Now I'm paying the mortgage on your condo and you're telling me I can't go to the family dinner for my daughter's recital night. Oh no. Let me plot and plan with this Pisces moon and let me get something together. And he stewed on that with all that cancer, Pisces, cancer, cancer, uh, Scorpio, brewing, top with that Leo, the cherry on the top that says, you don't run me. Yes, he did. He did not have somebody else. There wasn't a secret person. There wasn't anybody on the side. Was Nicole innocent? No, she could fight her battles. She could fight her battles. The problem with Nicole is she didn't have the esteem to say, I don't need this situation. And it could have been, I wasn't there. It could have been for one reason or another, she couldn't get out of it. And I think part of that, I'm sad to say this, is that you become accustomed to a certain lifestyle. But um, I think that if she had lived, she would have made it on her own on doing something else. Anyways, guys, that's what happened in that story. Wow. What a situation. Um, Thank you guys for listening. Please subscribe, thumbs up, comment, share, share, share. Let's try to grow this channel really quickly. Thank you guys. Have a good night.